The previous video dived right into relational database models by presenting tables of example data. But this video will take a step back at the database design process to define database schemata, which is a pretentious way of pluralizing the word schema. You can also say schemas if you prefer. A schema is simply a way of listing the relevant information of a database's structure without any actual records being presented. Essentially, it is a way of formatting information about the table's column headers, but also a way of describing how foreign keys and tables relate to primary keys in other tables or even in the same table. At the end of the previous video, we had a database for storing data about songs, albums, and artists. The schema for that database would be the following. Each table is followed by a parenthesized list of its column names. The primary key for each table is underlined. And in several cases, we actually have a composite primary key composed of several columns. The last thing that needs to be added to this schema are arrows showing the connections between foreign keys and primary keys, though text descriptions could also be used to simply indicate where each foreign key points. Here is the version with arrows. Each foreign key has an arrow pointing to the primary key that it is the foreign key for. The table with the primary key is the home relation for the foreign key. We see that many tables have artist ID as a foreign key. The subtypes band and musician are actually weak entities with respect to the strong artist entity. Interestingly, the artist ID that they use as a foreign key is also their own primary key. The member, features, and contains tables have composite primary keys consisting of combinations of attributes. The member primary key is the two foreign keys of the musician's artist ID and the band's artist ID. The features primary key combines the foreign keys of song ID and artist ID. The contains table uses not just the foreign keys of album ID and song ID, but also track number in the composite primary key, on the off chance that a given album has the exact same recording twice in two different track numbers. When we create a database, we typically also specify constraints on the attributes. We've actually already specified some constraints in this diagram. The underlined primary keys are subject to non-null and uniqueness constraints. You can also have these constraints individually on any given attribute, even if it's not a primary key. The foreign keys are subject to referential integrity constraints, meaning that any foreign key value must be null or be equal to a primary key in the home relationship. Another common constraint that is not visualized here is the domain constraint. These assure that each attribute comes from the proper domain. However, the actual domain may be hard to programmatically specify, so an actual database system will often settle for type constraints. Based on the data that we saw in these tables in the previous video, all ID fields for primary and foreign keys are constrained to be positive integers. The track numbers must also be positive integers. All names are constrained to be strings, and although none was evident, there would typically be a maximum allowable length on such strings. Birth date is a date, and duration is a measurement of time. Additional logical constraints could be defined on top of these basic categories. Remember that a schema is a logical model of the data. A relational model is just one example of a logical model. A typical design process involves starting from an entity relationship model, or an extended entity relationship model, and creating a relational schema out of it. This process is known as forward engineering, and various hints about how to carry out this process have already been sprinkled throughout this video and the previous one. However, let's focus for a moment on reverse engineering, which is the process of taking a logical schema like this one and inferring the original ER or EER model out of it. So, once again, here is our logical schema. We're going to convert this back to an ER model. However, just to make things a bit more difficult, 
let's remove the helpful semantic information behind the names of our tables and fields. Here is a schema that is equivalent to the one that you just saw, but purposefully shuffled around a bit and with the names made generic. The goal of reverse engineering is to infer a plausible entity relationship model based on this schema. So what is our process? Well, first, we will single out tables with no foreign keys. These will be strong entities in the ER model, and their columns will be attributes. And in this particular schema, the tables H and E meet this classification. So H has a primary key of B, and E has a primary key of C, and an additional attribute of lowercase e. Next, we identify tables whose primary keys are composites of multiple foreign keys. These tables will become many-to-many -many relationships, and the foreign key attributes will no longer be present in the model. This applies to tables A, F, and G in our schema. These tables contain some foreign keys whose home relations were not in our model yet, so we have added entities B, C, and D to the model. Other attributes and associated relationships for these entities are not modeled yet. Notice that table G's primary key was a composite of C, A, and D. But only two of them were foreign keys. There can be tables with more than two foreign keys composited into a primary key, and in such cases we would have an in airy relationship. But in this case, the extra attribute, D, is not a foreign key. However, since it was part of the composite primary key, it is the primary key of this new relationship, G, here. The next type of schema element to consider are tables that have distinct primary and foreign keys. This could represent a one-to-many relationship from the home entity to the entity with the foreign key, or a one-to-one -one relationship. Either way, each table will be a separate entity with its own attributes, and there will be a relationship connecting them. We can't know the cardinality of the relationship without seeing actual data, but assuming the relationships are one-to-many is a reasonable starting point and happens to be true for the data we are working with. As before, the foreign key will no longer be represented as an attribute since the new relationship represents the connection to the home entity. Only table B meets these requirements because it has foreign keys D and A1. These attributes will not be part of the entity B, but will instead be represented as relationships that are simply named after the two entities being connected. So we have a relationship called B to B and a relationship called B to H. The B to B relationship is recursive, specifically a recursive binary relationship also known as a unary relationship. The other relationship, B to H, is a normal binary relationship. The rest of B's attributes are also depicted in this model, including its primary key, A, and its additional attributes, J and K. The entities, C and D, are still disconnected from the rest of the schema and are missing attributes. These tables each have a primary key that is also a foreign key whose home is in table H. This typically indicates that these are weak entities that have a one-to-one -one relationship with their strong parent entity. Recall that this fact is indicated by double lines in both the diamonds and rectangles representing the relationships and weak entities, respectively. Entities C and D each have their respective attributes, but do not possess primary keys since they depend on the existence of the entity H, whose primary key is B. This is a complete ER model, and we can now fill in the original entity attribute and relationship names to see how much sense it makes. With respect to the parts of our music enterprise that we have chosen to model in this video, this entity relationship model is fairly close to the one that we had at the end of the video on extended entity relationship models, except that it only uses standard ER model features and no extended features. Albums can contain multiple songs, and a song can be contained by multiple albums. A song can be covered by many songs, and an artist can sing many songs. But each song only has one artist. Artists can feature on many songs, 
and songs can have many featured artists. A musician can be a member of many bands, and bands feature many musicians. The main difference from the previous video is the use of weak entities to model musician and band. We know from the semantics of the domain that a musician is an artist, and a band is also an artist. This is why I've labeled the relationship from each weak entity to artist simply with is. However, being in an is a relationship with a parent entity is exactly what it means to be a subset. As we know from the extended entity relationship model video, we can either model musician and artist as disjoint subsets of artist, which would look like this. Notice that the weak entities are gone and we have a specialization circle with D in it for disjoint and the two subset symbols on the lines from musician and band to that specialization. So we could have this with the subsets or we could model the artist as the union of musician and band, which would look like this. Now the specialization circle has the union symbol in it and the subset goes in the opposite direction with artists being the subset of, or rather the union, of musician and band. Both options are similar to each other and also to the results at the end of the EER model video from before. This indicates that we have successfully reverse engineered the schema to get back to an EER model. Since the relational model that we started with here was already designed with some reference to the previous EER model, we won't go through the process of forward engineering into a schema in full detail, but I'll briefly summarize the process before ending this video. Strong entities become tables and attributes become columns. Weak entities also become tables but must contain the primary key of their parent. Many-to-many -many relationships become their own tables containing foreign keys of each entity participating in the relationship. One-to-many relationships are handled by placing a foreign key in the table on the many side of the relationship. One-to-one -one relationships can be handled by placing a foreign key on either side of the relationship, though one should strive to reduce the number of null entries. As for extended entity relationship model features, a union is modeled with separate tables for each possible superset in addition to the union subset. The supersets must contain a foreign key for the union subset. This is also one possible approach for modeling multiple subsets. That's actually option three here, a table for a superset and each subset. Though other approaches that we saw in the previous video are one table for all the sets, superset and subsets, or one table for each subset and no table for the superset. But this only works for disjoint sets only. No matter what you're doing, the design process doesn't stop at the ER or EER model. There's a lot of work that has to be done to figure out how to take that concept and work it into a logical design for an actual database.